Okay, today's passage is from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. 1 Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. Listen to the word. So then, man ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human, human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of man's heart. At that time, each will receive his prize from God. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. I do not know how to describe you, the great and indescribable God, by my sinful lips, but by the grace and love of God, who has mercy on, on us, let the experience of the full presence of the Holy Spirit take place at this time. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Are you uh, successful today? What does success mean to you? Imagine a man who makes lots of money, yet he had no money at first, and he was not well educated. We would say this man is doing well in his career and quite successful. How much are you earning? But people these days would say making lots of money is not enough. They say you are only successful if you own many properties with no mortgage. How many properties do you own? If success is prestige and power, how high have you climbed the corporate ladder? On my way driving to work early in the morning, as I drive past um, areas like um, Ulara, Double Bay, Rose Bay, and Bondi Beach, you see people jogging and exercising near the beach. And I feel like, well, they are, wow, they are very diligent people. Then an hour or two later, the streets are filled with more diligent and well-dressed people waiting for a bus or driving to work. And I start thinking, why are these people exercising and working so hard? Why are they living so hard? What are they running towards? What are they expecting at the end of their lives? What does life mean to them? Imagine if you make lots of money living in a big house close to the eastern beaches you're not really into cars, so you just have a German-made new sedan parked in the triple lock-up garage for traveling to work, dropping off and picking up the keys at school if you're female. You bought a block of building in the CBD, which has been recently demolished and rebuilt a year ago. And the value of your new building has doubled today. You are well known in your field of work. 99% of the world, world would look at these top 1% of people and say these people are successful. And there is probably no one here who wouldn't want to be part of that 1%. How would God view this kind of success? How does God measure success? As Christians living in this world, we are often frustrated with where we are heading. We wonder if it's okay to live like this. We cannot stop asking ourselves what does a successful life look like to God. Today's passage tells us that God measures success by faithfulness. How faithful are you to God? Faithfulness 
is not a virtue appreciated much today. We see it in marriage, relationship between spouses. Before marriage and before woman even ask, man promised to the woman that I will give you everything I can. I will give up my life and my heart to you forever and ever. How lovely is it to see when woman totally depend on and trust man till the end, that is until the keys are born. Nevertheless, why should we remain faithful? God wants us to be faithful to what he has called us to do. Jesus said, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. God is not going to measure you based on how much money you make, how many properties you own, how well known you are, or how much, how much talent you have. He's not going to measure you based on how many people you've evangelized, how many years you've served the church, or how many great things you've done. These are all important, and we expect these things. We tend to believe that these outcomes are the measures of our success. But growth comes from God himself. We cannot achieve anything on our own with our, with our efforts alone. We can't save anyone unless the Holy Spirit works through us and in them. We can only deliver the message of gospel and leave everything to God. God only wants to see our faithfulness. Paul was experiencing some difficulties with his ministry in the Corinthian church. If we go by popularity and numbers, Paul's ministry at Corinth does not seem to be very successful. People were judging him, but they still listened to what he told them. Paul says in verse, verses 3 and 4, I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Amen. True success is not measured by what man can see, but by what God sees. Therefore, my judges, says Paul, is not man or even myself, but God. And how will God judge us? He says it in verses 1 and 2. Notice the two words Paul uses in verse 1. Servant and entrusted or given a trust in verse 2. Servant and entrusted or given a trust. These words describe the work of a steward or slave. We are, we are not familiar with masters and slaves in our culture today. But the people of Corinth understood immediately what Paul was saying. A steward was a confidential slave to whom the master entrusted his affairs. He was an administrator of the master's household, but still a slave of the master. Although he had great responsibility, he is always and in everything accountable to the master. Both he and his work belong to the master. This is the description of you and me. We are redeemed by the Lord. We belong to him. He is our Lord and master, for he redeemed us by his blood. And this life comes from him. And he has given us all a trust, a work. The most basic one is the great commission to share the gospel. All of us have a different calling. Some are called to be pastors, some teachers, some evangelists. But whatever it is, it is God's work and we are his servants. A young man applied for a job as a farmhand 
When the farmer asked for his qualification, he said, I can sleep when the wind blows. This puzzled the farmer. But he liked the young man and hired him. A few days later, the farmer and his wife were awakened in the night by a violent storm. They quickly began to check things out to see if all was secure. They found that the shutters of the farmhouse had been securely fastened. A good supply of logs had been set next to the fireplace. The young man slept soundly. The farmer and his wife then inspected their property. They found that the farm tools had been placed in the storage shed, safe from the elements. The barn was properly locked. Even the animals were calm. All was well. The farmer then understood the meaning of the young man's words. I can sleep when the wind blows. Because the farm hand did his work loyally and faithfully, when the skies were clear, he was prepared for the storm when it broke. So when the wind blew, he was not afraid. He could sleep in peace. There was nothing dramatic or sensational in the young boy's preparations. His secret was to just faithfully do what was needed each day. Consequently, peace was his, even in a storm. Paul says, Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Amen. Looking at the parable of talents Jesus told in Matthew chapter 25, verse 14, will give us a better understanding. It is the story of servants who have all been given talents and how faithfully they used the talents entrusted to them by their master. Also, if you turn to Matthew chapter 24, verse 45 to 46, should be up on the screen, Jesus says, who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Amen. Therefore, whether we are doing something big or small, we must do what God has entrusted us. We must share the gospel of Christ directly, bringing them to church or praying for the unsaved. Paul tells the Corinthians in his second letter, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 to 20, says, All this is from God, who reconciled the world to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he was committed to us, the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Amen. If you were a boss or master, what's the one quality you'd look for in a worker or servant? The one quality that God looks for is faithfulness. Notice what Paul says about being faithful. It is required. As servants of, as servants of God, as God's children entrusted with the gospel, we are required to be faithful to this cause. If we go back to the parable of talents, God is not going to see your success in terms of quantity, output, not even by how many people you evangelized. Because you can't save anyone unless the Holy Spirit works through you and in them. But you must be faithful whether God has given us one, two, or five talents. That means we don't have to, be, we don't have to compare our accomplishments. It is the wrong measurement. Whether you are called to be praying for others, to teach, to be part of the worship preparation team, 
to wash dishes, to clean the hall after service, to mow the lawn, whatever it is. The most important thing that we remember is how faithful are we to what God called each of us to do. God is looking for faithfulness. We must be faithful. God has entrusted the work of his kingdom to us and wants us to be faithful to his calling. We must be prepared to see him when Jesus returns and be accountable for what we've done. We have to be faithful to his word and his work. The world interprets success differently. Being faithful is not the key to a successful life, but it is in the eyes of God. Let me ask, are we living in this world with restricted eyes? Or are we living in this world with eyes looking beyond what we can see? Desiring God's kingdom. Look at the disciples. Most of them died as criminals in the eyes of the world. Hebrew chapter 11, verse 36 to 37 describes what happened to many of Jesus' followers. Listen to the word. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sold in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. Amen. They suffered because they chose to remain faithful to God's word and God's work. According to the world's standards, all of them were absolutely inflexible, foolish, stubborn, and failures. Yet, Hebrew chapter 11, verse 38 says, The world was not worthy of them. Amen. All these people were called failures by the world, yet they were honored by God. Why? Because they were faithful and loyal to their master. Who is our master, the world or God? They were faithful servants. They were successful, not because of money and power, not because of prestige or popularity, but only because they were found to be faithful to to the Lord. They were faithful in obeying his word and doing his work until death. Years ago, I heard a story about a preacher who went to a small town to preach a series of gospel sermons. His attempt was to evangelize that little town. He preached for two weeks. During the whole time, only one child, only little girl, responded to the invitation at the end of one of his sermons. She confessed Christ, was baptized, and turned out to be the only one convert during the entire meeting. The preacher judged the meeting a failure and for years bemoaned the great effort he had made for such little result. However, he did not have the right view of things. That little girl grew up to be a strong, faithful Christian woman. She married a Christian man and together they produced several sons all of whom became preachers of the gospel. Those sons converted thousands of unbelievers to Christ. Now, what do you suppose would have happened to that little girl and her family had that gospel preacher not faithfully proclaimed Christ? Do you really think that preacher's effort was a failure because he had converted only one little girl? Aren't we still seeking the things that we can see? Sometimes what looks like a very small, insignificant effort on our part turns out to be far greater than we think. His name is Tom Rayner. In his book, 
Eating the Elephant, Tom Rainer tells of an interview Billy Graham had with an interviewer. The interviewer was fascinated by Reverend Graham's success and asked if he anticipated being given great rewards in heaven for the millions of lives he had impacted through his worldwide ministry. Billy Graham said that he was not sure of the extent of his own rewards. God is the final judge. But he was certain that others would have greater reward than he. He went on to say that there is a faithful elderly woman whom he knows, who is right now on her knees praying for her little country church, her family, and her nation. For nearly 80 years, the sweet lady has been faithful to the Lord. She has been constantly praying and reading the Bible daily. To Billy Graham, that lady and many others like her, without name or fame, will receive the greatest rewards in heaven. At the close of the interview, Billy Graham said these last words, You see, we are not called to be successful. We are called to be faithful. Whenever God gives us responsibility, let us accept it and do our best. Be faithful. Treat each small task as important and demonstrate that God is guiding us. There is only one reason we are called to be faithful, to show that even with a few things, we are faithful, loyal, and accountable. One day, we are going to hear the Lord say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Matthew chapter 25, verse 23 says, His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Luke chapter 16 verse 10 says, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Amen. God's beloved, you are not alone in this world. We have a God who is our Lord and Savior. One day, we'll all face Him and give an answer to to our life. Why? Because we receive this life from Him. He made us and loved us. So please value this time that's been given to you and make it into a time, into a time of precious devotion. Because this time will never come back to you. A time of devotion is at the heart of Jesus Christ. It is a heart of love that grows for others. But it's also a time of suffering. Everyone matures in different ways and in their, in their own God-given time. However, everyone on the path of faith will face suffering. Everyone matures in different ways and in their own God-given time. But this is the time we understand the meaning of the cross. One day we'll confess, How did I get survive all this suffering? How did I get so low? I pray that we will all be able to confess that it was not by my effort or power, but because I walked with God, following the lead of our Lord through the high and tough mountains. Brothers and sisters, I pray in the name of Jesus that we will meet again at the top of heaven for eternal rest and to hear the trumpets of victory. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. If you will make just one wish to come true, let us boldly hope that we are faithful to God. 
We've wandered the world for so many years. But now let us live with all our heart and sincerity before God. If it's true that our life only passes once like a candle, let us be a burnt offering, praising God, bearing the witness of Jesus Christ. Let our humbleness raise our brothers and sisters. Let our hard work, devotion, and faithfulness be the light of the gospel to many dying souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.